Happy Monday, everybody. Hope you all had a pleasant weekend. Uh, I do not have anything at the top, so we can go straight to your questions. Uh, Josh, you want to kick us off here? Sure. Thanks, Josh. Uh, I wanted to start with the, the two Libyans who were transferred out of uh, Guantanamo Bay, uh, announced today by the Pentagon. Mm -hmm. uh, with the number of remaining detainees there uh, once again lowered, uh, how much longer does the White House plan uh, to wait to continue to give Congress time to look at your plan before you um, move ahead with potential um, executive actions to close the prison? Mm -hmm. uh, well, Josh, let's go to the news first, which is that the Department of Defense did announce uh, the transfer of two Libyan <coughs> nationals to the Republic of Senegal earlier today. Uh, with those transfers, there are now 80, 89 detainees remaining at the prison at Guantanamo Bay. Uh, let me also express our gratitude. Uh, to uh, the nation, the Republic of Senegal, uh, for this significant humanitarian gesture. Uh, the United States appreciates the, appreciates the generous assistance of the government of Senegal as the United States continues its efforts to close the detention facility at Guantanamo Bay. This is part of a strategy that the President initiated uh, when he first arrived in the White House. Um, this, the, the decision to transfer these two, these two detainees uh, reflects the careful analysis of a review board that, uh, that was established to consider the individual cases of detainees. The review board's goal was to determine if there are locations to which individuals could be safely transferred under the right circumstances. Uh, and Senegal has agreed uh, to put in place uh, appropriate mechanisms that would mitigate the risk that these individuals could pose to U.S. national security down the line. So we certainly are appreciative of the cooperation we've received from Senegal for that effort. And uh, this does enhance our ability to continue to make the case to Congress that we can effectively close the prison at Guantanamo Bay. And we can do that entirely consistent with our national security options, or uh, entirely consistent with our national security priorities. Uh, and, um, and we're going to continue to make that case. So, uh, so e even though it's getting farther and farther into the last year of, uh, of his presidency, um, the current plan is to continue sticking with expecting that Congress at some point may reverse course and allow you to close the prison? Yeah. Well, Josh, this refrain may sound familiar to you, but yes, the administration <laughs> is going to continue to do our job, and Congress should do their job in fulfilling uh, their responsibilities to look out for the national security interests of the American people. Uh, we certainly have applied that label when it comes to the Supreme Court, but it also applies to our uh, to a range of national security considerations as well. And it's not just the president, it's not just this president that has made the case that closing the prison at Guantanamo Bay would clearly be in our national security interest. Uh, this is a case that has been supported by national security experts in both parties, uh, including President uh, George W. Bush and a whole range of officials who served in his administration. Uh, this is also a strategy that is strongly supported uh, by the Secretary of Defense. So our national security interests here are clear, and uh, we would welcome uh, Congress uh, stopping their um, you know, efforts to uh, obstruct the closing of the prison in Guantanamo Bay and actually work effective w effectively with the administration to get that done. I wanted to see if you had any information about uh, the release of uh, some uh, private documents from this bank in uh, Panama regarding uh, some offshore accounts that people had. Uh, the Kremlin has said that, that uh, President Putin was the, the main target of that uh, breach. Um, do you have reason to believe that's the case? Any other information about what it might have been uh, behind this whole document dump? <coughs> yeah. um, Obviously, we've seen the, you know, the extensive reporting that's been done on uh, these leaked documents. Uh, I, I don't have a comment on the specific allegations that are included in those documents, uh, but I can tell you that the United States continues to, to be a leading advocate for increased transparency in the international financial system uh, and in working against illicit financial transactions and in fighting uh, corruption. Uh, there's been a lot of talk over the course of the last year or so about how effective uh, U.S. sanctions that are imposed by the Treasury Department can be effective in advancing the national security interests of the United States. Uh, that's true if we are uh, isolating the Russians because of their um, uh, violation of the territorial integrity of the sovereign nation of Ukraine, or 
increasingly isolating and pressuring the North Korean regime to give up their pursuit of, um, of nuclear weapons, uh, or in targeting uh, ISIL's financing operations. So that's why the United States is a leading advocate of greater transparency in these kinds of international financial transactions. Um, greater transparency allows us to root out corruption uh, and to fight uh, efforts to get around uh, U.S. Uh, sanctions that have been put in place. So. Um, you know, we're going to continue to uh, be leading advocates for that kind of transparency, and there, are, there will continue to be uh, large groups of national security professionals at the Department of Justice and at the Department of Treasury uh, who will continue to be focused on these issues. And uh, in North Carolina, we've seen um, some major companies, Pepsi and even um, the state of New York, see that they're going to try and uh, limit the kind of travel they're doing to that state. Essentially, uh, uh, boycotting the state over this law that they've enacted regarding uh, transgender people. Uh, is there any consideration about doing that as far as the federal government, you know, not having federal employees travel there when they can avoid it to try and not promote what the state has done there? Uh, I'm not aware of a policy decision like that that's been reached, but uh, you know, there are some both policy and legal questions that are raised by the passage of this law, and there are a number of government agencies that are um, thinking through those questions now and taking a look at what impact it may have on existing law. I can just say that more generally this administration is committed uh, to defending uh, and even promoting the equal rights of all Americans, including LGBT Americans. And our commitment to that principle that people shouldn't be discriminated against just because of who they love uh, is one that's worth fighting for. Uh, and this administration and this president will continue to speak out uh, in support of those uh, equal rights because uh, that's part and partial of what it means to live in the greatest country in the world. Can you be any more specific about some of those things that you might be considering or, or uh, effects from that that mm -hmm. people are taking into account? Uh, I'm not able to be from here, but there are a range of individual agencies that are taking a look at this. Uh, and um, so obviously you can ask them you know, if they've reached any determinations about how uh, uh, this particular law would have an impact on their interactions with the state of North Carolina. Uh, I, well, I will just say that um, it's not surprising to me that there are a number of significant business entities that have come out uh, to express their concerns about uh, this law. Uh, obviously, the state of North Carolina has an economy that has benefited significantly from uh, what officials in that state proudly describe as a hospitable business environment. Passages of laws like this do not create a hospitable, hospitable business, business environment, particularly if businesses are concerned that either their employees or their customers are not going to be treated fairly by the state or going to be singled out by the state. Uh, and uh, I'm not surprised to hear that uh, government officials in North Carolina are feeling some pressure on this right now. Okay. Roberta. Um, back to Gitmo for a second. Um, the Democratic governor of Colorado has said that he opposes housing former uh, Guantanamo detainees in his state. And I'm wondering whether the White House has talked to the governor about this and how his opposition um, might affect the president's pledge to close the uh, facility. Well, I don't have any uh, specific White House conversations to tell you about. But obviously, what the White House would be committed to uh, is ensuring that we work effectively with state and local officials uh, in uh, implementing uh, you know, a strategy successfully. Uh, but to talk about any individual state is to get ahead of the game, uh, because right now Congress is focused on preventing the transfer of those detainees to any state in the United States. Now, of course, Congress's position is rather ironic because there are, are already dozens of convicted terrorists that are currently uh, serving prison time in the United States on U.S. soil in U.S. prisons. And the administration has, made it for, has forcefully made the case that the ability of our criminal justice system to prosecute those individuals and hold them accountable for their crimes in a way that's consistent with our values actually does enhance our national security. What also enhances our national security uh, is detaining those individuals in prisons where they can uh, not uh, pose a future threat to U.S. national security. So uh, we found a mechanism for handling these kinds of cases responsibly. Uh, that's why the case that is made by members of Congress is, um, frankly, inconsistent with available evidence. Uh, 
Uh, and particularly when we know that continuing to detain these individuals at the prison at Guantanamo Bay that is inconsistent with our values and does give extremist organizations uh, the kind of propaganda victory and recruiting tool that they've already used effectively. And why we would continue to provide that to them makes no sense to me. So no specific comment on what the governor of Colorado has, has said at this, at this stage anyway? Uh, uh, correct. Okay, and on Afghanistan, a topic that came up this morning in the president's meeting, mm -hmm. uh, General John Nicholson said today that U.S. and NATO are behind schedule in training because of the intense combat and fighting that has been happening there. And I'm wondering if you can speak about how that's going to affect President Obama's decision on when and how to further draw down troops there. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, let me start by saying that obviously we welcome the valuable contribution that NATO has made to our efforts in Afghanistan. Uh, much of the progress that we have made in Afghanistan uh, would not have been possible without the significant contributions that NATO has made to that effort. And it's part, it is that effective partnership that allowed the United States to succeed in decimating core al-Qaeda that previously operated with virtual impunity in the uh, Afghanistan-Pakistan region. And we've made uh, enormous progress in helping the Afghan government begin to assume uh, much more control for the security situation in their own country. And that ultimately is the uh, key to our success. And that's been a long road, uh, and we've got uh, a substantial uh, journey ahead of us uh, before um, we can see the kind of resolution uh, in Afghanistan that we would like to see. But there's no denying that we've made important progress. Uh, and uh, you know, the United States and our military personnel in Afghanistan are going to continue to focus on their two missions, which uh, are counterterrorism uh, and uh, training Afghan security forces. Um, uh, NATO obviously plays an important role in supporting uh, those missions, particularly the second one. And we have seen improved performance uh, by the Afghan security forces on the battlefield, and they've been tested. There's no denying that. Uh, and you know, we're going to continue to stand with them as they counter uh, the threat from extremists inside their borders. Okay. Mike. Uh, thanks. Uh, two questions. To go back to Josh's question on the North Carolina mm -hmm. law, um, you know, the agencies pointing to the agencies, I mean, the agencies might have the details, but I guess my question would be, is the administration comfortable that whatever the agencies decide, the White House is willing to accept, even if that decision would be, for example, to shut off all federal funding for schools? in North Carolina or all federal funding for housing or all federal funding for transportation? I mean, if that, if that would be what <coughs> the agencies would decide, does the White House say, yeah, go ahead and do that? Or, or yeah. do you guys have a position on how far you're willing to go in this? And then second, do you have any thoughts on the court's ruling today on one person, one vote? Well, uh, on, the, um, uh, on the decisions that agencies have to make, I I'm not aware that any of the agencies um, are considering going quite that far. I'm not sure that the um, the law would allow it, let alone, uh, you know, the broader policy implications of making a decision that's that far-reaching. Uh, but ultimately, individual agency officials will take a, a close look at what impact this particular law would have on the legal and policy questions that are raised. Um, Is that something that so, would eventually weigh in on before action were taken? Whatever that action would be, even if it were less than Well, I, I certainly, obviously, the, the White House is in regular uh, uh, communication with these individual agencies, but right now, uh, the work that's being done is at the agency level, and uh, I certainly wouldn't rule out that the that the White House at some point would need to be involved in that effort. Uh, but right now, it's the agency officials who are taking a, a, a close look at this. Um, your second question was on the Supreme Court ruling today. Uh, obviously, uh, I think you've seen from the Department of Justice uh, that um, they were pleased with the ruling. Many of the arguments that were effectively made by the Solicitor General before the court uh, were incorporated uh, into uh, the decision that the justice has reached. Um, it, it certainly is consistent with, generally speaking, it's consistent with um, the arguments that the government has made about the most uh, fair and effective way uh, for American citizens to, um, to elect their representatives in government at all levels. Okay. Mary. 
Uh, back to the so-called Panama Papers. Uh, several close U.S. allies are also implicated, including the President of Argentina, who President Obama visited just two weeks ago, uh, the Saudi King, whom the President's going to meet with in two weeks. How concerned is the President that several allies seem to be shielding their money in this way, and, and does he plan to address it with them? Yeah. Well, I understand that President Macri, for example, has already, uh, has already addressed this. Uh, I'm not going to be able to consider the individual uh, claims that are, uh, that are made based on uh, some information included in the documents. It's, uh, based on some of the reports that I've seen, there are some 11 million documents that have been released. So my guess is it's going to take even the most astute experts uh, a little while to analyze all the information that's included in there. Um, but look, this, uh, this, uh, this uh, you know, large volume of documents does not change the U.S. position, which is that there should be greater transparency in international financial transactions. And there are a whole host of reasons for that. Many of them are consistent with our uh, national security interests. And we continue to advocate for that kind of transparency on, the, uh, on, the inter on an international scale. Uh, I can tell you that even in spite of um, uh, some of the lack of transparency that exists in many of these transactions, there are determined uh, experts at both the Department of Treasury and the Department of Justice uh, who can examine these transactions uh, uh, or who are regularly you know, examining transactions uh, on the, uh, uh, in the international markets to determine uh, their consistency uh, with um, uh, sanctions that the United States has imposed or even laws uh, that are on the books here in the United States. And on the Supreme Court and the President's nominee, despite the White House's campaign efforts by Senate Democrats, there doesn't seem to have been much, if any, shift uh, in Republicans' desire to hold any kind of confirmation hearing or a vote. Uh, why do you think that is, and, and is Mitch McConnell outmaneuvering you on this one? Well, uh, you'll recall that just in the hours after Justice Scalia's untimely death, uh, Leader McConnell was quite clear that the President should not nominate um, a successor. Uh, to fill that vacancy on the Supreme Court. Uh, that, of course, is in conflict with the constitutional obligations, both of the President and of the United States Congress. And, you know, we've seen uh, some visible discomfort on the part of Republican senators trying to defend that position. Uh, that's why we've seen such a large number of Republican senators come forward and indicate that they are, in fact, prepared to meet with the President's nominee. Uh, tomorrow, uh, the President's nominee will meet with two Republican senators, uh, both uh, Senator Collins of Maine and Senator Bozeman from uh, Arkansas. And uh, even over the weekend, Senator Cornyn, who uh, is an enthusiastic supporter of uh, uh, Leader McConnell's position on this, has acknowledged that there's a slippery slope. Uh, he explained uh, that um, that's why they're trying to draw a hard line here in refusing to in any way consider the President's nominee. Uh, his view is um, uh, uh, those are his words. Uh, it's a slippery slope toward the confirmation of what he described as an Obama judge. Um, and so that's why we feel like we have uh, made some important progress here. I think that progress is evident from um, some of the public opinion polls that your news organizations have conducted, uh, indicating that it's not just Democrats who uh, oppose the um, strategy that Republicans have pursued here. Uh, it's even Republican voters who are uncomfortable with the position that is taken by Republican leaders uh, on this matter. Even Republican voters believe that members of the United States Senate should do their job. And it is evident right now that many Republican senators are refusing to do so. They're refusing to do the job that they were elected to do. And they're not doing it because of some crisis of conscience. They're doing it because they're following the orders of the Republican leader in Washington, D.C. That's not really a recipe for success because the last time I checked, and again, I'm no political expert here, but the last time I checked, the uh, public's view of the Republican leadership in Washington, D.C. is not particularly high. It's not particularly favorable, even among Republicans. And I think that is what is hard for Republicans in the Senate to justify to their constituents. And I think that's why, you know, even as uh, Chairman Grassley was doing uh, town hall meetings in the most conservative part of his state, that he even faced uh, some tough pressing questions about this. Uh, he described uh, resenting the suggestion that somehow he wasn't doing his job. Uh, we heard Senator Moran in Kansas, who has taken a couple of different positions on this issue, indicate that he doesn't like being accused by his constituents of not doing his job. He'd prefer to just take a vote. 
I suspect that that position of refusing to take a vote is even more difficult to defend when the only reason you're refusing to take that vote is because you're taking orders from the Republican leader in the United States Senate. So uh, that's why I feel like we've made uh, some progress in at least putting some pressure on Republicans. And we're starting to see uh, some Republicans acknowledge. Uh, you see some Republicans who've actually come out and say that there should be a vote. Senator Kirk put it rather colorfully himself in suggesting that his colleagues should, quote, man up and vote. Uh, um, he's right. Uh, and uh, to her credit, uh, even one of his um, <laughs> colleagues in the Republican Party in the United States Senate, who's not a man, suggested that they should step up to the plate uh, and vote. So, uh, you know, we are uh, seeing uh, some progress to be made here. And uh, we're hopeful that uh, Republicans will continue to uh, venture down the, uh, uh, the slippery slope that Senator Cornyn described. So you're still optimistic that these meetings and these conversations that are happening will still ultimately lead them to change their minds and hold an actual hearing or a vote? Because so far we're just hearing about conversations, not really, you're not seeing that sea change that you would need to, to get that design. Well, out I think there has been a sea change when it comes to actual meetings, that there was an expression on the part of the Republican leadership uh, in Washington that their members weren't going to have meetings with the president's nominee. But yet we've seen 17 different members of the Republican members of the United States Senate uh, indicate a willingness to do that. And Senator Kirk met with uh, Chief Judge Garland last week. Uh, and there'll be a couple more that uh, the Chief Judge Garland uh, uh, will meet with tomorrow, both Senators Bozeman and, and Collins. And again, I think the reason that this is complicated for Republicans uh, is not just based on their constitutional responsibility. This would be a difficult position for Republicans to defend no matter who the president had nominated to the Supreme Court. But the fact that the president has nominated an individual of unquestioned uh, legal credentials, somebody who has more experience on the federal judicial bench than any other nominee in the history of the Supreme Court, and the fact that the president nominated somebody who even a leading Republican has described as a consensus nominee, makes their position even harder to defend than it otherwise would be. Uh, and again, the fact that they're only, the only explanation that they can come up with is this is what the Republican leadership in Washington, D.C. wants me to do. That, that's a that's a pretty tough position to defend. Okay, Justin. Um, I wanted to look back first on the NATO meeting this morning. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm wondering the extent to which Donald Trump's comments last week about NATO either inspired the, the meeting or came up during the meeting between, between the two leaders. Uh, the the meeting with the NATO Secretary General was actually organized uh, uh, shortly after the first of the year. So this is something that's been on the books. Uh, long before Mr. Trump's ill-advised comments uh, about uh, the importance of the U.S.-NATO relationship. Um, I, I did not get a detailed readout of the meeting. Um, I would be very surprised if uh, there was any extensive conversation that involved Mr. Trump in the meeting. I wanted to run down a couple other things that came out of the Panama Papers. Um, the disclosures did show uh, ties to more, more than 30 people who had been sanctioned by the U.S., whether Mexican drug cartels, North Korea, all, sort of all the things that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm wondering, I know that you said that we've got kind of dedicated people working on this, but do these revelations prompt new questions about the effectiveness of our sanctions regime? And is there something that the Treasury Department will be doing after these revelations to sort of change their enforcement of those sanctions? Well, I think it's too early to tell about, uh, too early to tell whether or not a change in the implementation of these sanctions is warranted. Um, I think the available evidence indicates to us that the efforts that are put in place by the Treasury Department to impose sanctions, to combat terrorist financing, uh, are effective. Um, you know, we've seen the since the imposition of international sanctions against Russia, for example, based on uh, their violation of the sovereignty of Ukraine, the Russian economy has weakened significantly since then. There are a host of factors that have contributed to that, but uh, part of that has been the effective implementation of sanctions. Um, going back to the uh, agreement with Iran, uh, the United States organized the international community to impose sanctions against Iran. Uh, that is what compelled Iran to the negotiating table and eventually compelled Iran to uh, agree with the rest of the international community not to obtain a nuclear weapon. 
so I think we've already seen the effectiveness of uh, our sanctions at work, and we're continually looking for ways to um, ensure that the implementation of those sanctions is more effective. Um, that is why we continue to advocate for more transparency, for greater transparency in uh, the international financial system. Um, it, it's not at all a surprise to anybody in the administration, I don't think it's a surprise to you, that there are people who are looking for illicit ways to get around uh, U.S. sanctions. Uh, and to the extent that there's any evidence uh, that they are doing that, uh, I think it would only be common sense that we might uh, learn from steps that they have taken uh, to ensure that our sanctions can have the maximum impact. Um, they also included details about Ukrainian President Poroshenko, um, especially that he had kind of created a shell company in the middle of the turmoil in, in 2014. Um, a big part of your guys' effort uh, in Ukraine, and especially tying aid to Ukraine, is rooting out corruption there. And so I'm wondering if anything in there has at all sort of led the U.S. to reevaluate either their support for President Poroshenko or, or concer heightened concerns about corruption in Ukraine. No. And uh, for a couple of reasons. The first is that, uh, again, I, I can't comment on any of the specific allegations that have been raised uh, by these documents. Um, you know, given the large volume of documents that are included in here, I think it's hard to, to jump to any conclusions right away. But what's also true is that uh, President Poroshenko, Poroshenko has demonstrated a commitment, uh, on, uh, along with the rest of the government of Ukraine, to implementing a whole bunch of anti-corruption reforms uh, in Ukraine. And all along, the United States has continued to encourage President Poroshenko and other senior officials in the Ukrainian government to follow through with implementing those anti-corruption reforms. Uh, there's more work that, that needs to be done, uh, but when you consider the record of President Poroshenko's uh, predecessor, um, uh, it's clear that they've made some important progress. And what's clear also is that the successful implementation of those anti-corruption reforms will be critical to the long-term success of the, of, uh, of the nation of Ukraine. And as the United States continues to support Ukraine uh, in offering some security assistance, but also in terms of providing economic assistance, we're also going to continue to encourage them to implement those reforms faithfully to ensure the long-term success of our partner. There's been some calls from um, leaders around the world for kind of an international effort to uh, address some of these flaws in the, in the international banking system. I'm wondering if that's something that the U.S. would be willing to lead and if there are any plans to use this uh, as kind of a, a springboard for maybe things that the U.S. has been advocating for for a long time or, or new ideas that have come up kind of based on the, re the revelations. Well, again, I'm, I'm not aware of any specific uh, change in our policy or any, you know, the creation of a new body as a result of uh, these documents, but look, they've only been public for you know, 24 hours or so now. Um, but whether or not these documents reveal uh, substantive, legitimate evidence uh, of people thwarting uh, monitors of the international financial system, the United States will continue to be uh, a leading advocate of greater transparency in our financial system. And um, that is, that's something that we have long uh, pursued. Uh, and we're going to continue to be at the forefront of making that argument because uh, it contributes to our national security. And there are officials both at the Treasury <coughs> Department and the Department of Justice who have responsibilities here. Uh, much uh, the effective completion uh, or the, the effective implementation uh, of those strategies by the Department of Treasury and the Department of Justice uh, also rely on effective coordination with our partners around the world. Uh, so there obviously is an opportunity for the United States uh, to use some of our leverage as uh, a leader in this field and as the world's largest economy uh, to bring about some of the changes that we would like to see. And uh, again, we've been doing that for a long time, and uh, those efforts will only, uh, are only going to continue. Okay? Ron. On the North Carolina front, you said that the uh, White House is not involved in, at, at this point. Uh, in this agency review that's going on. What, what is the le president's level of interest and engagement? You've, you've said some very strong things about the, the law from the podium. I'm surprised that you're essentially, essentially distancing or creating some separation between the White House and, and this uh, issue of funding or other 
measures um, taken uh, against the yeah. North Carolina because of the law. Well, I, I don't mean to leave you with the perception that we're creating some distance. I just mean to leave you with the perception that this is the functional responsibility of individual agencies to determine whether or not this state passed law has any impact on any rules or regulations uh, that are on the books that would have an impact on agency funding or other agency policy decisions. So the agencies will consider uh, will consider that. They'll make that evaluation. They'll take a look at the law. They'll take a look at, uh, uh, at policy. Uh, and um, you know, if we reach the point where a, a process needs to be led by the White House to uh, make that kind of decision, then um, then we'll do that. We won't hesitate to do that. But right now, uh, this is a process that uh, that individual agencies are undertaking. Would you anticipate that that might happen? You might get to that point, given what we know about the law already. Is the is the um, uh, you called it? I think the word was well, mean spirited or something mm -hmm. like that. And, uh, mm -hmm. Given given how uh, outspoken the president has been about civil rights and gay and LGBT rights, I'm again. Would you expect that this might be something? principle that you really try to push hard? Well, I think as a matter of principle, uh, ensuring that individual Americans are not discriminated against because of who they love is something that the President feels strongly about. And the President will be forceful in making the case that, uh, that, uh, that he is going to stand on the side of fairness and justice uh, and equality. And he's done that throughout his seven years in office. He did that before he was elected President. And uh, I'm confident he'll do that uh, in the time that remains. As it relates to this specific law, though, and its impact on government policies, I think a lot of that's going to, de going to be determined by what agencies find. Uh, it may be that agencies find that uh, there's not much that can be done. Uh, but you know, again, it's the agencies that will lead that effort, and uh, I'm confident that uh, once they reach the point of announcing any decisions, that, um, uh, that they'll be in touch with the White House about that. Uh, on ISIS, um, at the uh, nuclear summit the other day, um, uh, in that session, the President said, uh, emphasized that he, um, uh, well, you had 50 world leaders, many of whom are part of the coalition, you had the NATO Secretary General here today. I I'm curious about what specific asks there were, if any, by the President of this group um, to try and, uh, I think he, he did use the words that there's now a sense of urgency uh, because of what happened in Brussels and yeah. because of the ongoing. I'm trying to determine what actually happened or what was said or what was requested that reflects some sense of urgency that uh, may uh, make the strategy or the response different now, more robust, or are we expected to see things as they've been? Well, look, I, the President is definitely committed to making sure that we continue to ramp up our efforts against ISIL. And we have been on this upward trajectory for quite some time now, and I think there are a variety of ways to evaluate that. Um, one way to evaluate that is the important progress that we've made in retaking uh, territory that ISIL had previously controlled. Uh, we've now retaken about 40 percent of the territory that ISIL previously controlled in Iraq. The percentage is smaller in Syria, but some of the strategic locations that have been recovered from ISIL uh, are having an impact on ISIL's ability to operate uh, in that country uh, and in coordination with their cells, not just in Iraq, but in some other locations too. Uh, all that is valuable. Uh, you know, we've also seen us escalate our campaign uh, in terms of the efforts against ISIL's leadership uh, in Syria. And I know that uh, the Department of Defense over the weekend announced a couple of dozen strikes that were taken just over the weekend uh, by United States and coalition fighters against ISIL targets inside of Syria. So, um, you know, we, we maintain a pretty rapid pace here. And that's evidence of the priority that the President uh, has placed on the effort to degrade and ultimately destroy ISIL. I think the value of the meeting was to ensure that all of the leaders uh, who are involved in this effort understands uh, why this is a priority for the President of the United States. It was an opportunity to uh, review the important <coughs> progress that our coalition has made. And it was an opportunity to have, spend at least a little time discussing what are the priority areas that require the attention of our counter-ISIL coalition to further degrade and destroy ISIL. Well, what, are uh, those, what are those areas? Well, so I'm trying I, to get at what specifically... Yeah, well, I, I don't have a detailed readout of the meeting, but what I can tell you is that uh, the President made clear that when people like Secretary Carter uh, or when Ambassador Brett McGurk come calling to these individual nations and are visiting with their counterparts about uh, uh, important contributions that they can make to our counter-ISIL coalition, the President made clear that when those individuals are ask making a request to those countries, that they're making a request on behalf of the President of the United States uh, and that it should be prioritized accordingly. And uh, we are hopeful that that will continue to um, 
uh, allow us to leverage the contributions of a wide variety of members to our coalition uh, to continue to ramp up our activities against ISIL, and whether that's our military con uh, contribution or whether that is a contribution to our counterfinancing efforts or even a contribution uh, to our efforts to counter uh, ISIL's uh, online radicalization efforts. There are a variety of ways that people can contribute, and uh, we're hopeful that we'll see a steady increase in the contributions that are being made. What about specifically NATO? Because as, uh, I, as the Secretary General explained, I, NATO is not a part of the coalition except that many members are part of the coalition. Mm -hmm. Um, but in as much as there was an attack in Brussels down the street, figuratively from NATO headquarters, yeah. can we expect NATO to play a, a more, again, the, the word robust role in, in, the, in that particular mission against ISIS? Yeah. Well, I think you'd have to ask uh, uh, Secretary General Stoltenberg about that. But I can tell you um, that we value the contributions that we've received from the uh, large number of NATO members who are part of our, of our counter ISIL coalition. And um, uh, it underscores why NATO uh, is an important uh, body. Each of the individual countries who's a part of the uh, NATO alliance makes substantial contributions to their defense and security uh, apparatus uh, because of important NATO obligations that they have and ensuring that our partners and allies uh, have properly invested in that security infrastructure uh, is one way that we can ensure that we've got partners around the world that can help us uh, when we need it. Uh, and so that's how they can ensure that they're equipped to assist the United States and our, and our counter ISIL uh, coalition partners because they have those resources, because they've maintained that long-term commitment uh, to uh, a robust um, defense capability, and we certainly welcome that. And is the President satisfied with where those spending levels are now? I think the Secretary General made the point of 2015 being the first year that the collective figure did not decrease. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the case that we have made strongly uh, to individual NATO members uh, is that in order to fulfill their NATO obligations, they should devote 2 percent of their uh, uh, GDP to their defense capabilities. And uh, there are some NATO countries that meet that and some that don't. Uh, and we're going to continue to make the case that uh, that kind of investment on the front end uh, is critical to the national security of every member of the alliance. Did the President's free rider comment come up at all in the meeting? Uh, I didn't get a detailed readout of the meeting, but uh, 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 if it did, I'm, uh, I'm confident again that that was not the, uh, uh, the focus of the conversation. You said, you said that the Trump comments weren't you, uh, didn't come up or were you, you're, you look yeah. on your face as well. well <laughs> I, I think my point is that they had, um, they had a lot of really important things to discuss, and uh, I'm not sure that uh, Mr. Trump's comments would fall in that category. Okay. Mike, Josh, nice to see you. Thank you. Nice to see you. Uh, was there any effort to reassure the Secretary General uh, following Mr. Trump's comments in recent days? Uh, I'm not sure that it was necessary, quite frankly. Um, President Obama has spoken at length about how important the U.S.-NATO relationship is. Uh, Mike, you, you may even recall, uh, you may have been covering the White House full-time at, at this point, back in 2011, uh, when the President traveled, made a state visit to uh, London, uh, and he gave a speech to the uh, members of uh, the British Parliament uh, about the importance of the, um, not just the U.S.-U.K. alliance, uh, but the importance of NATO as a building block uh, in uh, United States national security posture. Uh, and you know, that's, uh, uh, that uh, alliance uh, is something that President Obama has long acknowledged is critical to our national security. And it has benefited from uh, uh, our investment uh, in making sure that alliance remains strong. And uh, the President will certainly be interested in advocating for uh, the election of a successor who believes in the importance of maintaining a strong relationship with NATO. With terrorism hitting NATO countries, <coughs> is there an effort to reformat or refocus the alliance to focus on terrorism? Well, I think, Mike, there are a variety of ways in which NATO member countries are very focused on, uh, on terrorism. And whether it's um, fighting extremists in Afghanistan, uh, which uh, NATO has been doing side by side with the United States for more than a decade, uh, or individual countries who are fighting extremism within their borders uh, and benefiting from 
the support and cooperation uh, of NATO allies. For example, the United States has been strong uh, in offering our support to both uh, the French and the Belgians uh, in um, countering some of the, uh, the extremism that they've seen uh, inside their countries. Uh, and so uh, given the national security concerns of many of the <coughs> members of NATO, uh, it's clear that, uh, that the need to fight terrorism uh, is uh, a priority uh, of NATO member countries. The Navy says in recent days it stopped an Iranian vessel loaded with weapons likely heading for Yemen, uh, 1,500 AK-47s, 200 RPG launchers, 2150 caliber machine guns. Is that an example of the Iranians following the letter of the agreement but not necessarily <coughs> the spirit of it, or, or is that a violation? Well, I think one thing that this illustrates is the commitment on the part of the United States to uh, countering uh, Iran's destabilizing activities in the region. We obviously work with a whole host of other countries uh, in that effort, and one of the things that President Obama will discuss at the GC summit in Saudi Arabia uh, next month, or I guess it's later this month now, uh, will be uh, ramping up our efforts to, um, to counter uh, Iran's destabilizing activities in the region. And one example of their destabilizing activities is their ongoing material, uh, material support <coughs> for Houthi rebels uh, in Yemen. Um, what I can tell you is that uh, uh, we obviously are concerned uh, about this development because offering up support to the rebels in Yemen is, uh, uh, is something that is not at all consistent <coughs> with uh, UN Security Council uh, resolutions. And uh, I'm confident that the United States and uh, our other partners on the Security Council will uh, take a close look at this incident, uh, consider the uh, available evidence, and uh, if and when it's appropriate, uh, raise this for uh, other members of the Security Council. Would the United States like to see some kind of consequences for this kind of destabilizing behavior? Uh, I think at this point it's too early to say uh, exactly what we would suggest. But uh, again, I think this is a clear illustration that the United States is quite serious about working with other countries in the region uh, to counter uh, Iran's destabilizing activities in the Middle East. Okay, Margaret. Josh, um, on Guantanamo, you use the phrase significant humanitarian gesture by Senegal. Mm -hmm. That's not language you normally hear from the administration. What, what's so different about these two, two detainees versus the ones taken in by Estonia or you know, all the other countries that have taken in yeah. uh, released detainees? Uh, I, I don't have the details about these individuals, uh, about these individual detainees. Uh, I'm sure the Department of Defense could provide you with some additional information uh, about them. Uh, but you know, we certainly have welcomed uh, the willingness on the part of other countries to take in uh, Gitmo detainees, and in some cases we have described it as a humanitarian gesture. So uh, I didn't use that language to send a signal that, this, that, the, that the case of these two individuals was a clear outlier, uh, but rather to uh, demonstrate uh, our appreciation uh, to the Republic of Senegal for, um, uh, for agreeing to this step. It's usually just DOD. The State Department used that phrase, you use that phrase here. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm just wondering if, given where we are on the calendar, if there is some, something more to the gratitude you're expressing here. Is this because it is crunch time that we do really need these other countries to step up and take in uh, prisoners if you're going to stick to your schedule of closing the place down by January? Yeah. Well, we certainly are going to be very focused in our diplomatic efforts uh, to work with countries around the world uh, to uh, settle upon uh, security requirements that could be put in place uh, that um, would mitigate the risk that transferred Gitmo detainees uh, would pose to the United States. And I certainly wouldn't rule that out. Uh, I think the other thing that I wanted to acknowledge today is the fact that this is actually the, uh, these are the first two Gitmo detainees that Senegal has agreed to take. Uh, and so obviously they are, um, they've made an important policy decision uh, that benefits the United States. and. It seemed appropriate in this setting to express our gratitude. Um, can we expect then more uh, transfers in the month to come, given <coughs> where we are on the calendar yeah. and that it is crunch time? Uh, I, I'm not aware of uh, uh, of any specific. Well, let me just say it this way: uh, I don't have any transfers to tell you about right now. But uh, obviously, there is a process that 
the Department of Defense and the State Department have been following to reduce the population uh, at the prison at Guantanamo Bay. And before they can make a transfer like this, the Secretary of Defense has to personally certify that appropriate steps have been taken to mitigate the risk that these individuals would pose to the United States. So that is why we make a strong case that these transfers are clearly consistent with enhancing the national security of the United States. But since the White House put forward that plan to shut down Guantanamo Bay, I mean, have you seen anything to signal that this is anything other than dead on arrival and that you'll be entirely dependent on transfers like these? Well, uh, what I will say is that we have been disappointed by the reaction of many Republicans uh, to this plan. Uh, we saw people like Senator Roberts from Kansas. Um, it's unclear if he even read the document before he f uh, took a selfie of himself crumbling it and throwing it into the trash can. Um, I think that is an indication that Republicans don't take this very seriously. Uh, and I think it is an indication, as I mentioned to Josh, that Republicans in particular uh, are not willing to do their job when it comes to uh, the national security of the United States. And they'll have to answer to the voters for that. Uh, and they'll have to make their case to the voters uh, about why, uh, again, uh, you know, taking a selfie of uh, yourself uh, crumbling a piece of paper and throwing it in a trash can is consistent with serious consideration of an important national security priority. Um, but uh, this administration is going to take seriously our responsibility to protect the American people. And that means working uh, assiduously within the law to close the prison at Guantanamo Bay, primarily because it's a waste of money to continue to operate it in the method that is, uh, in the manner in which it's currently operated. We could save hundreds of millions of dollars over the long term uh, by closing the prison, transferring those that can be safely transferred, uh, and housing uh, the remaining detainees uh, in a facility here in the United States. That also would remove an important recruiting tool that we know that extremist organizations have used to radicalize people around the world. Uh, so uh, I recognize the politics of this are a little complicated, uh, but by presenting basic facts, particularly the fact that there are dozens of convicted terrorists that are currently being detained uh, on American soil and housed in American prisons, uh, I think this is where uh, you would expect people who uh, are genuinely concerned about protecting the United States, uh, willing to work cooperative cooperatively uh, with the administration uh, to advance that goal. Um, question for you on refugee policy broadly. Europe began forcing migrants uh, out of European territory back onto Turkish shores or other points. I mean, what is the White House view on this? Do you view it as somewhat similar to the forced deportations that the U.S. has undertook along its border? Well, uh, let me just start by saying that the United States shares the desire to uh, protect people fly, fleeing a desperate si situation in Syria or other places across the Aegean Sea. Uh, we also uh, are committed to supporting the effort to crack down on the deadly smugglers who prey upon these desperate individuals. Uh, far too many innocent lives have been lost merely to line the pockets of criminal syndicates. and. It's, uh, it's deplorable, and it's why the United States has been strongly supportive of the EU's efforts, um, along with Turkey, to try to confront this situation. And we commend the commitment from the EU, its member states, and Turkey, uh, who have demonstrated that they are seeking a comprehensive and coordinated response to the current influx of migrants and refugees from Syria and other nations. Um, they've. We've seen the, the, both the EU and Turkey commit to making sure uh, that the individuals, uh, these migrants or these refugees, are, are being given access to due process to make sure that their uh, international um, uh, rights are not just respected but actually protected. Uh, and uh, that obviously is a, an important priority of the United States. Uh, what's also an important priority is making sure that we can find an orderly way to meet the basic humanitarian needs of these individuals. Um, you know, we're talking about, in some cases, families who have fled their homes just trying to escape violence, or in some cases to escape genocide. Uh, and that's why the United States has stepped forward and offered more than $5 billion in humanitarian assistance to try to meet the needs of these individuals. The United States is actually the largest bilateral donor of humanitarian assistance. 
Uh, that, in some cases, that means offering direct humanitarian assistance to those who have been displaced internally inside of Syria. Uh, in other cases, that actually means providing assistance to uh, other countries like Turkey uh, that are bearing a significant burden uh, by housing a significant number of, uh, uh, of Syrian migrants. And uh, the United States is serious about continuing to offer that kind of support, and that will continue. Did this come up in the meeting with the NATO Secretary General, and is it similar to the U.S.'s own deportation of migrants? Uh, I don't know whether or not this came up with, uh, with, uh, with the NATO Secretary General in the President's meeting with him today. Uh, I think it is difficult to compare uh, these two uh, situations, both the situation of the uh, you know, refugees fleeing violence in Syria and uh, the, the situation that we've seen with some <coughs> Central American countries. Um, I think the one thing that they do have in common is a commitment on the part of the United States to uh, the basic protection of, um, uh, of the human rights uh, of individuals who are uh, fleeing violence in their home countries. And certainly in the United States, we've made access to due process uh, a critical component of, um, uh, of this process. And um, we have been gratified to see uh, the EU and Turkey prioritize those rights as well. Okay, Michelle. So despite how these kind of papers got out there and the fact that this is private information and, I mean, some of it is not illegal activity, likely. I mean, there's 11 million pages there. Mm -hmm. Does the White House think that this is a positive thing, that it was leaked? Well, I, I think at this point it's hard to uh, assess whether or not that's an entirely positive thing. I, I think it's what's still unclear is exactly how these documents became public. Uh, and I know that there are, that even that uh, is something that continues to be under investigation. Um, so I, I think that's going to prevent me from uh, reaching a hard and fast assessment about that right now. But you use the leak as a way to state that the U.S. has been a leading advocate for transparency. Mm -hmm. uh, but this, this transparency, obviously, the, the reason it's out there is because of some leak that wasn't intended. Well, so, uh, again, I, I don't want to speculate about why it may be out there. It also may be out there because somebody stole the documents and gave them to a reporter. Exactly. Um, so, it's a leak. Well, <laughs> uh, I, I think stealing documents and giving them to a reporter is different than uh, sharing, an informa sharing information with a reporter that might not, other might not otherwise be public. Um, I'm not an attorney, but I do think that there is a, a, is I mean, a difference it, there. It's private information uh, on people's financial records mm -hmm. that was Mm -hmm. unintentionally and without their permission put out there. Mm -hmm. um, but you sort of answered the question as if this was a positive thing, so. Well, I think I tried to answer the question by suggesting that regardless of whether or not these documents had, documents had been made public or not, the United States would continue to, be, continue to be a leading advocate for making more of these transactions more transparent. And the value in that is it will enhance the ability of the United States and our national security professionals uh, to uh, enforce U.S. sanctions, to counter corruption, to shut down terrorist financing, uh, and uh, put an end, uh, or at least limit, the kind of illicit financing efforts that are actually contrary to U.S. national security interests. Okay, and um, at the national, uh, the nuclear security summit, the president, of course, took a question on Donald Trump, mm -hmm. and he took the opportunity to answer pretty extensively. He did. So, he, he gets these questions all the time now, pretty much every time he does a press conference, and lately he has been more effusive in his responses. So does he dread these questions that he's always going to get now, or does he relish the opportunity to counter that messaging? Well, again, if, uh, if Mr. Trump does become the nominee, I suspect that uh, over the course of the summer and fall, as the President's campaigning for the Democratic nominee, uh, you will, uh, the President will have many more opportunities to highlight the difference in approach uh, between that, that which is advocated by Mr. Trump and that which is advocated by uh, Democrats uh, and, in some cases, even this administration. Um, I, I think, you know, particularly when it comes to questions related to nuclear policy, I think the President welcomed the opportunity uh, to use uh, Mr. Trump's uh, unwise position to illustrate the wisdom of the approach that this administration has pursued, which is to prioritize the international effort to prevent uh, the spread of nuclear materials. And the, pe the President was able to make a strong case uh, in describing exactly why that is in our national security interest uh, and to describe the important progress that we've made over the last seven years uh, in removing nuclear material from uh, some 13 or 14 countries around the world 
and um, that certainly makes that nuclear material harder to be turned into a nuclear weapon or to be um, uh, stolen by terrorists with bad intentions. Uh, so there are a variety of, uh, of ways to make that case, but in comparison to the, uh, the ill-informed, unwise, intemperate remarks of uh, Mr. Trump, I think only serves to illustrate the benefits of President Obama's approach. Um, and both you and the president have said on multiple occasions that um, that kind of rhetoric that some of the candidates, including Trump, have been putting out there uh, is damaging to the U.S.'s standing in the world. Do you think that that damage has already been done? Well, I um, no, I don't think that that damage has been done. I think that the uh, the damage is in, is in concern that is expressed by people around the world about whether, whether or not the United States is going to continue to stand for and fight for the kinds of values that have been central to this country since our nation's founding more than 200 years ago. Uh, the fact that Mr. Trump and other Republican candidates want to walk away from some of those values uh, and in some cases even talk down those values uh, isn't just disappointing, it's unsettling to our allies that continue to depend on the United States as an ardent defender uh, of basic human rights, of smart policy, uh, particularly when it comes to something as important as nuclear weapons or our NATO alliance. Uh, so, um, you know, I, I think ultimately uh, ensuring that we have leadership uh, in the United States that continues to support those values and to be a leading advocate in fighting to advance those values uh, isn't just critical to uh, our national security and isn't just uh, important to living up to the values that this, the citizens of this country have long cherished, it's also critical to ensuring uh, strong relations with some of our closest allies around the world. So, I mean, the president met with a number of leaders at this summit. Does he find himself needing to reassure people and, and counter the stuff that's been going on in the campaigns this season? Well, I don't think the president spends uh, much time uh, saying something to those who ask him about this in private uh, than he does in public. Uh, and what the president said in public is he's not particularly concerned about Mr. Trump becoming president of the United States. He doesn't think that's going to happen. Uh, he has expressed his concern about the way that other Republican candidates have, um, in a desperate attempt to try to keep up with Mr. Trump's supposed popularity, uh, have even given voice to some of those comments. Uh, but the president retains a lot of confidence in the commitment of the American people uh, to those values. And I think that's um, you know, one piece of evidence that you can point to uh, is the way that the Democratic candidates for president uh, have strongly supported those values throughout the campaign and have not wavered uh, on them, uh, even in some difficult uh, political situations. So I think that uh, gives the president, the American people, and our allies around the world uh, confidence that the U.S. commitment to basic human rights, to smart nuclear policy, to our NATO uh, alliance, uh, uh, is unwavering, uh, despite the uh, uh, despite what you hear at some uh, Republican campaign rallies. But you, you did mention that it's unsettling to allies that there's concern out there. Mm -hmm. So does the president have to have conversations with them about this specifically? But yeah, uh, he does. I think he's ad admitted as much, at least in that news conference on Friday. Uh, but again, the conversations that he has in public are not that different, or in private, uh, are not different than the kinds of. Uh, the, than the confidence that you heard him express previously in public. Okay, April. Josh, um, I want to ask you why and how did Senegal get in the mix when it came to the detainees? And is there a history with um, the Senegalese having um, high value prisoners in their possession at any time? Well, this is actually the first time that Senegal has agreed to take uh, Gitmo detainees. Uh, these two individuals are the first two Gitmo detainees to be transferred to Senegal. So you asked the White House, asked them? Uh, well, the administration did, and the State Department is obviously the, the lead of negotiating these diplomatic agreements with other countries to both get them to agree to take these individuals, but also to adhere to a whole set of security requirements that uh, prevent them from posing an undue threat to U.S. national security. And the Secretary of Defense is responsible for certifying that those security requirements are sufficient. Uh, to mitigate any risk that they would pose to the United States. So is there any involvement with the African Union when it comes to uh, these detainees in Senegal? Uh, I'm not, I don't, I don't know the answer to that, but uh, I suppose you can check with the State Department about that. Okay. Uh, Juliet. 
Hi, Josh. I was wondering if you could provide a little context to the HUD policy that's being rolled out today, which is saying that a person's criminal record should not be an automatic disqualifier to being able to rent housing in mm -hmm. that instance. Well, uh, the, uh, the idea here, uh, and this is a policy that Secretary Castro uh, will roll out, is that the, the agency wants to ensure, uh, or at least take a stif significant step toward ensuring, uh, that people with criminal records aren't being illegally denied housing opportunities. And the idea is to make clear to housing providers across the country uh, that blanket bans against people with criminal records uh, violate the Fair Housing Act when they disproportionately deny housing to people of color. Uh, and this pursuit of eliminating discrimination uh, in the housing sector uh, is something that President Obama has made a priority. Uh, but I can tell you it's something that both uh, Secretary Castro and his predecessor, um, Sean Donovan, who's now at OMB, uh, also made a priority. And um, understanding the way that housing policy can have an influence on communities all across the country uh, is to understand why Preventing discrimination in this field is something that can have a significant impact uh, on our broader society. Uh, and can you describe to what extent you think this has been a problem, for example, returning offenders, or you know, how has this played out, this idea that people in the past have been denied? Well, the concern, obviously, is that, uh, that um, a broad application of a ban uh, against people with criminal records disproportionately impacts people of color. And that is a source of, uh, of significant concern. Eliminating that kind of discrimination in our housing policy can have broader societal effects. The second thing is the administration has obviously made uh, the ability of people who have served their time and paid their debt to society to re-enter uh, our society is a critical part of criminal justice reform. Giving people a second chance, particularly people who have paid their debt to society uh, is a priority, not just to the administration, but I think of the country. And again, this goes to something that Speaker Ryan talked about last week uh, in talking about how his faith and his sense of values uh, animates his uh, view of the importance of giving people a second chance. And there are already a whole host of significant obstacles that people um, re-entering society and coming out of uh, incarceration face. Uh, from finding a job uh, to finding a support network um, and to throw up uh, or to e erect barriers to being able to find housing uh, is going to make it r quite difficult uh, for individuals who are emerging from our criminal justice system to establish the kind of basis that they'll need to uh, find a job uh, and to build a, a new life for themselves. So. You know, obviously, you know, this is a, a policy that was carefully considered by Secretary Castro, uh, but it's one that the ad administration as a whole enthusiastically supports. And just one question on the North Carolina law. In the course of the President's time in office, is there another time that you can recall the administration has done an agency-wide review of potential retaliatory response to a state law that, in the eyes of the administration, violated whether it's civil rights or other principles? Yeah. Um, I, I think what you'd probably have to do is to check with individual agencies, because obviously this is not a review that was ordered by the White House, but rather these were individual agencies uh, who were consulting the uh, laws that are, who are consulting the laws that are on the books uh, and the policies that have been in place in the, under this administration to determine whether some sort of response is necessary. Uh, I don't think this is something that is uh, uh, outside of standard operating procedure. Uh, but you'd have to talk to uh, individual agencies to determine uh, exactly what that standard operating procedure is. Okay. Thanks, Anita. Josh. Anita. Can you um, talk a little bit about the President's trip on Thursday, just the first part, the Chicago part? Sure. Obviously, he's talked about the Supreme Court before. What's the new message and why Chicago, Illinois? What is he going to call out certain senators? What's the well, uh, why Chicago? The, the President, uh, you may recall, taught constitutional law uh, at the University of Chicago. And returning to that venue, to have a discussion about the constitutional responsibilities before the United States Senate uh, seems appropriate. And it will be an opportunity for the President to discuss uh, 
you know, why he considers uh, his responsibility to fill a vacancy on the Supreme Court so important. Uh, I'm confident that he'll spend a little time talking about how he arrived at the decision to uh, nominate uh, Chief Judge Garland uh, for this important position. Uh, and I'm confident that the President will reiterate uh, a case that you've heard him make a number of times now, that the Senate should set aside partisan considerations and actually focus on their constitutional responsibility. Um, he'll say that the Senate, members of the Senate should uh, do their job. Uh, and um, uh, and that's, a, uh, that's an argument that you've heard him make before, but uh, making it in a venue where the President has previously talked about the importance of, uh, of constitutional law is uh, the idea behind Thursday's event. Do you think he'll mention certain specific <laughs> senators? He hasn't really done that. I uh, no, I, I, would not, I, I don't know necessarily whether or not um, he will, uh, well, whether or not he will mention certain senators, although I suspect that, uh, for example, Leader McConnell or Chairman Grassley's name might come up. Um, they have a pretty important role in this process that uh, they're not playing right now, and that's uh, sort of the whole point here. And then, um, since he is going back home, so to speak, and he did the same thing in Springfield a couple months ago, just wondering, sort of, is he feeling nostalgic? What's the, this is the second time he's gone to deliver sort of a speech about, you know, something important to him that he wants to talk about. The other was partisan politics and yeah. dysfunction in Washington. What's, what's going on? He feeling his last year? Well, I, I think, uh, I think what's going on is that, that, that both uh, locations are appropriate ways to illustrate how consistently the President has fought for a whole set of values and principles uh, even before he entered the White House. So when it came to Springfield, uh, the President devoted a significant portion of his speech uh, before the Illinois legislature to talking about how important it was to the success of the Illinois legislature for Democrats and Republicans to be able to work together. Um, that's something that the Illinois legislature did effectively when Senator Obama was there. And there's a, a similar parallel that the President is hoping to draw by traveling to the University of Chicago. Prior to entering the White House, prior to running uh, for the United States Senate, the President spent a lot of time thinking about and writing about and talking about and teaching constitutional principles. And many of those constitutional principles are now in the broader discussion about whether or not the Senate's going to do its job and whether or not individual senators are going to do their jobs uh, when it comes to fulfilling their constitutional responsibility to evaluate and give a fair hearing and an up or down vote to the President's nominee to the Supreme Court. Okay. Cheryl. Um, thanks, Josh. OMB completed its review of the fiduciary rule um, yesterday. And do you expect the President to roll out that rule this week? Uh, I don't have any uh, uh, updates beyond what uh, uh, OMB has said about that rule. We've made a strong case uh, about why this is, uh, uh, why some changes were necessary. Um, that right now there are uh, too many uh, financial advisors that are not putting their um, clients' interests first. Uh, and uh, by not doing that, uh, we've seen you know, a waste of some $17 billion in retirement savings. Um, that's not, uh, given that the President has made retirement security a top priority, uh, we believe, frankly, that we should standardize best practices across the, uh, across the industry, uh, particularly when it comes to offering retirement advice. The good news here is that for financial advisors who are already placing their customers' interests uh, at the top of the list, uh, they don't have to do anything differently. But this is a, this is a regulation that, uh, if and when implemented, uh, would just focus on those individuals, those uh, financial advisors, uh, who are not putting their customers' interests first. And that's um, that for all of the hullabaloo about this, uh, that's why the President uh, and the Administration think this is a pretty common sense rule. So no timing update, because Speaker Ryan last week was very concerned about this rule. <coughs> Yeah. Uh, I don't have a timing update, but uh, we'll keep you posted. Okay. Mark? Josh, can you say whether Senegal asked 
that its acceptance of the two detainees be portrayed as a humanitarian gesture uh, <coughs> as part of the deal to accepting them? Uh, I'm not aware of any specific requests that were made by the Republic of Senegal, uh, but I can tell you that it's not the first time that I or my counterparts in the administration have described these kinds of transfers as a humanitarian gesture. Okay. okay. All right, Lala, I'll give you the last one. Uh, thanks, Josh. I wanted to ask you a follow-up question on what the President said on Friday uh, at his press conference. Why does the U.S. think that India and Pakistan pose a major challenge when it comes to nuclear security? What are the challenges coming from and what is the U.S. doing to address that? Well, uh, Lala, I can tell you that the President's comments uh, were motivated by the concern that we have about nuclear and missile developments in South Asia. Uh, in particular, we're concerned by the increased security challenges that accompany growing stockpiles, particularly tactical nuclear weapons, tactical nuclear weapons that, that, is, that are designed for use on the battlefield. Uh, and uh, these systems are a source of concern because they're susceptible to theft due to their size and mode of employment. Um, you know, essentially, they, uh, by having these smaller weapons, uh, they, uh, the threshold for their use is lowered, and the risk that a conventional conflict between Israel or between India and Pakistan uh, could escalate uh, to include the use of nuclear weapons. Um, so uh, this is why the administration has regularly expressed concern about any sort of um, tactical nuclear weapon. Uh, and our hope is that improvements in bilateral relations between India and Pakistan uh, could greatly enhance prospects for lasting peace, stability, and prosperity uh, in the region. Uh, and it, it is important, and the United States has made this case to both countries, uh, that there be a sustained and resilient dialogue uh, between the two neighbors. Uh, and we're encouraging all parties in the region to act with maximum restraint and to work collaboratively uh, toward reducing tensions uh, in the region. Obviously, the United States benefits from the partnership that we have with both countries. We value it, and it's why we continue to make the case to our partners, both in India and Pakistan, that de-escalating the tension uh, between these two countries uh, or between the two countries is a, uh, is a priority. Uh, and we certainly made clear the concerns that we have about uh, the development of tactical nuclear weapons or so-called battlefield uh, nuclear weapons. And the issue was discussed uh, with the Indian and Pakistani delegations uh, during the Nuclear Security Summit last week? Uh, I, I, in general, I can tell you that these are issues that we have raised uh, with uh, both countries directly. I don't have a lot of information about individual conversations with countries to, to discuss from here, uh, but I can tell you that this is a, a view that we have raised directly uh, with both India and Pakistan. The have reacted. They are saying that the President's statements reflects U.S. lack of understanding of India's defense postures. Many security experts, both in U.S. and India, say that India's main security threat comes from China, and it's all military modernization is based towards that angle. And you say, say the last part again. Uh, India's military modernization is based towards uh, its defense posture, which the security threat, which comes mostly from China, not from any other country. And US too is part of the India's defense modernization program. How do you react to India's uh, concerns on that? Well, I will. Uh, I will say that the United States uh, is committed uh, to developing the US-India relationship uh, into the one one of the defining <coughs> partnerships of the 21st century. And that includes uh, pursuing the strategic security dialogue that provides a dedicated venue to exchange ideas on India's intentions and defense needs uh, and to discuss issues that they may have related uh, to strategic stability. So these are the kinds of conversations that we have with our Indian counterparts. And we're certainly aware of the um, unique region of the world in which uh, India is located. And um, we certainly appreciate the need that India has to um, take the necessary steps to defend themselves. Uh, but the goal of the Nuclear Security Summit, as described earlier, uh, was to eventually uh, create a world without nuclear weapons. Uh, and that is a longer term goal and one that the President has long uh, 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 prioritized. Um, and 
the president does believe that that is something that can be pursued consistent with the relevant national security interests of countries around the world. And we're certainly going to be particularly concerned about and attuned to the national security concerns that are expressed by close partners of the United States like India. Uh, and that said, we do believe that evolving in this direction uh, is something that won't just enhance the national security of the United States, uh, it will also enhance the national security of India. Thank okay. you. Thanks a lot, everybody. We'll see you tomorrow.